Hey everyone, Patrick CK here with part two of my review of the Monoprice Maker Pro 10 Mini. In part one, we assemble the MP10. If you haven't seen it, I'll leave a card linking to that video. Today, we'll turn the MP10 on and try out a few prints to see the quality out of the box and explore some of its unique features. We'll be comparing the results to the V2 to see just how much better the MP10 is or not. Let's jump right into it by installing the included micro SD card. Popping in the SD card is straightforward. It's spring loaded here, which is different from the simpler slided in of the V2. But like the V2, you insert SD card with the connectors facing up. Not sure why this orientation feels so weird because it's pretty common with other devices. Just pop it in and it's secure. I prefer this setup over the V2. Next up, let's load the filament. I was going to use the provided filament, but it was too tangled and I didn't feel like messing with it. So I threw on a fresh one kilo spool. Loading the filament into the MP10 is significantly different from the V2. After mounting the roll, you feed the filament through this block, which houses the filament sensor. More on that later. From there, slide it into the feed motor which unlike the V2 is located on the vertical frame instead of on top of the print head. Partially compress the release lever as you feed through the filament. Don't try to completely squeeze the lever because it will push the tip of the filament away from the next opening. Now comes the interesting part. You have to feed the filament through the tube that leads down to the nozzle. You just have to feel your way as you feed the filament until it hits the end. I've noticed a small bump at the end that tells you you're at the nozzle. That and you won't be able to push any more filament through. I'm not sure how I feel about this setup. I do like that the feed motor is directly aligned with the filament spool and the tube makes sure the filament doesn't scrub against other components, but swapping out the filaments will be more tricky than V2 since you can't see how much filament is in the tube. I'll have to investigate the best ways to get that done. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on that video. Before we turn this thing on, let's remove the warning label from the bed. It should peel off nice and smooth. Let's fire this thing up. On the right side of the PSU is a large red power switch. You may have to slide the bed out of the way to reach it. The position of the switch is a little cumbersome to get to, but I guess there's not too many other places on the PSU that's any easier other than possibly on the back. Just be careful if the bed is hot. With the printer on, we get to check out the completely different UI from the V2. It's much simpler and of course touchscreen. But unlike the touchscreens on our smartphones, this is a resistive touchscreen, which means you can literally use anything to press the icons. It is a little finicky when using your fingers, so I would recommend using a pen or even the included scraper to navigate. Let's take a quick tour through the screens. Move is the most interesting screen, so let's start there. From this screen, we have the ability to retract or push the filament, move the print head left and right, up and down, and move the bed back and forth. The home button moves the print head to its home position at the front left corner of the bed. We were able to do all of this with the V2 using the knob in a little more clunky way. What we weren't able to do on the V2 is what we find under the tune button. This screen helps us adjust the print head to correct for the leveling of the bed. This doesn't mean you don't have to adjust the bed manually. As you may have spotted, there are still dials on each corner of the bed to make adjustments but these are there to help level the bed and not necessarily to change the height of it like with the V2. All I did was install one of those bubble leveling apps on my phone, laid it on the bed, and put the bubble dead center. Then came back to this screen to hit the auto leveling button. The auto leveling process moves the print head to certain spots on the bed and adjusts the height for any discrepancies automatically. At least I think that's what's happening. Either way, you can even further adjust the height using the close and far buttons. Close moves the head closer to the bed and far moves it further. What's really cool is that you can make these adjustments on the fly while you're printing. 
One thing to remember when making adjustments in this screen is that it won't take effect until you hit the check mark and confirm. So don't keep mashing the button assuming nothing is happening. We'll see this in action in a moment. If we back out of the tune screen and then go into the preheat screen, we are presented with a few options to preheat the printer. I like this setup because you can choose the exact temperature you want to heat the nozzle and the bed instead of choosing a material default like with the V2. Although the model data dictates the temperatures anyway. Lastly, if we go back to the home screen and go into the print screen, we see the list of files on the SD card. I've already added a bunch of new models. Originally, only cat.gcode was installed. Just select the file and it'll automatically get going. While the print screen has fewer details than the one on the V2, which included details like the coordinates of the print head, I guess that's not ultimately very useful. So narrowing down what info is presented works here. Plus, we have three more buttons we didn't have on the V2. Obviously, the pause button allows you to pause and resume a print. You can use this feature to, for instance, swap out the filament if you want a different color. The tune button takes us to the screen we saw earlier to fine tune the nozzle height while you're printing, which again is awesome. If you start a print and notice it's not adhering to the bed or the filament is too squeezed, you can make those adjustments on the fly instead of having to cancel the print altogether to make adjustments like you would have to with the V2. Like I said earlier though, those adjustments won't take effect until you confirm them. Lastly, we have the cancel button, which is self-explanatory. One thing that threw me off at first was the lack of a print percentage reading that I was used to seeing with the V2 until I realized there's a progress bar above the buttons that tells you how far along the print is. And at the end, it tells you how long the print actually took. Neat. So now the reason why you probably clicked on this video, how do the prints from the MP10 compare to the V2? I used two models to make the comparison, the good old Benchy tugboat and a model I made for a future project. These are both G-code files sliced up in Cura 4.6 with draft quality. First up the Benchy, and the comparison is striking to say the least. Many aspects of the Benchy have improved with the MP10. The hole is definitely smoother, not perfect, but a lot better than the V2. Then there's the improved definition of different parts like the holes for the anchor, the frames around the windows and doors. The cabin in general is better defined and smoother than the V2. Also, there's almost no stringing across the gaps compared to what we find on the V2. Again, it's not perfect, but for a print out of the box with a sub $300 printer, it's pretty impressive. Let's take a look at the other model. This miniaturized cityscape of downtown Atlanta is tricky to print due to the constant transitioning from building to building, which typically leads to a horrific amount of stringing between each building. But as we can see, the MP10 model turned out great compared to the V2. Just like the Benchy, all the surfaces are much smoother and it printed much faster because of the improved speed of the MP10. It's pretty obvious based on these two models that the stock MP10 is superior to the modified V2. The special features of the MP10 like the assisted bed leveling and being able to adjust the print head level on the fly makes this my new go-to printer. I'm not sure if I should keep trying to improve the V2 or wholly move my main project prints to the MP10. There's no harm in trying, so we'll see. At the same time, modding the MP10 will only improve it further. More on that in the future. For now, I'm going to keep playing around with MP10 to truly understand its capabilities and discover anything I might have missed in this video or the last. A link to buy your own MP10 will be in the description. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and share so others can find this content in the future. Until next time, this has been Patrick CK. Goodbye.